Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Anchor 2019. This year, as advertised, we are going to study the seven seals. We're going to study from Revelation chapter 4 through Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. It's going to be an exciting study. We're going to try and cover as much material as we can. Somebody was asking, how can you uh, have 24 sessions just on the seals? The answer is that there's a lot of material on the seals when you study them verse by verse and carefully. Now, uh, we are live streaming, so we also want to welcome those individuals who are watching on our television stations, some TV and some TV Latino. And we also want to thank those who are watching online. Uh, we want to welcome you to Anchor this year. I just want to announce that the syllabus at this point is not available for those who are watching our television channels and online. It will be available as soon as the class is finished, uh, not only for purchase, but also for free. If you go to our website and uh, do a search, you'll find the syllabus. You'll be able to uh, read it online. Uh, you'll also be able to download it if you wish. So it will be available as soon as the class uh, is finished. What we want to do in our class today after we have a word of prayer is go through the handout that you received at the very beginning that you have at your settings. And so let's have a word of prayer and then we're going to go through that introductory material that will help us understand the seals uh, all the better. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. We realize that we're living in very momentous times. Times when prophecy is being fulfilled everywhere we look. And the seals have a special message for this day. We ask that as we begin this series of classes that you will be with us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, that you will open our minds that we might understand, that you will open our hearts that we might receive, and that you will empower us to live in harmony with your will as history winds down to an end. We thank you, Father, for the promise of your presence, and uh, we ask that you will be with us. We claim that promise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. First of all, let's review the table of contents in your syllabus. This is a massive syllabus. You know, this is the second edition of the syllabus on the seals. The first one had uh, a little less than 200 pages. This one has 400, almost 450 pages. So a lot of material has been added. And I just want to go through the syllabus so we're all aware of what it contains and how much we're going to be able to cover in the class. First of all, chapters 1 through 8 basically deal with uh, the introductory vision to the seals. Now, I have covered this material before. Uh, I did a series on the 24 elders. However, uh, probably there's some people here who have never seen that series. And uh, so I'm going to cover that material again because it's crucially important for understanding the seals. So we can't just assume, well, let's just skip chapters 4 and 5 and go directly to chapter 6. So we are going to review that material on the 24 elders and the introductory vision of Revelation 4 and 5. So the first eight chapters deal with the introductory vision of Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. There's also two addendums to this section. In other words, additional studies that are added that are related to uh, the, cha uh, the chapters that we have there. The first addendum uh, is uh, concerning what happened on the day of Pentecost because we're going to notice that in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 really what you have is a description of Christ arriving in heaven to begin his intercessory ministry on the day of Pentecost. And so that addendum, the Lord is our rock, helps us understand a little bit better uh, what happened when Jesus arrived in heaven. Uh, the second addendum is called Chain Reaction, and that one has to do with uh, the persecutions that uh, started 
uh, right after the day of Pentecost and continued through the period of the Roman Empire. And uh, that's going to help us understand a little bit uh, more, uh, the, particularly the, the second seal of Revelation chapter 6. So uh, you have then the first eight chapters with the two addendums deal with introductory matters, the introductory vision of Revelation 4 and 5. Then uh, chapters 9 through 14 you have a study of the first six seals. And um, the majority of our time we are going to spend studying the, the six seals. Uh, then uh, chapter 15 deals with the Revelation 7 interlude. In other words, there's an interlude between uh, the first six seals and the seventh seal. And of course chapter 7 deals with the sealing of the 144,000. And the question is why is there that um, interruption or interlude between seal number 6 and seal number 7? There's a large section there that deals with the Revelation chapter 7 interlude. And then there's an entire chapter, uh, chapter 16, that deals with the seventh seal. The seventh seal is only one verse. There is silence in heaven for the space of about a half an hour. And um, you know I used to think that that referred to uh, perhaps uh, the second coming of Jesus is going to take seven days or we're going to take seven days uh, traveling back to heaven. But um, <clears throat> I think that there's a better explanation to that and we'll deal with the seventh seal in chapter 16. And then chapter 17 to 22 are chapters that deal with the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Basically, uh, we're probably not going to be able to cover all of those chapters. They are different ways of looking at the Sabbath Sunday issue at the end of time. Uh, if we have time at the end of the class, we will cover some of those, but I'm not sure if we're going to have time uh, to go through that. So you'll notice, for example, in the syllabus beginning on page uh, 331, what is God's eschatological seal? And basically that chapter uh, deals with uh, an objection that is presented to the Sabbath as the seal of God. Uh, you know, people say, well, but the Bible says that the seal is the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul says the seal is the Holy Spirit. So how come Adventists say that the seal is the Sabbath? That chapter answers that particular question that people ask. Uh, the next chapter, uh, the papacy, the Jesuits, and the Sabbath is a real eye-opening chapter because it deals with the papal strategy today, and of course the Pope is a Jesuit, to eventually enforce Sunday as a day of worship. Uh, there's been a, a change in the talking points of the Roman Catholic papacy, and uh, you can read that in that chapter. Then you have lessons from a forbidden tree, and basically that deals with the test of Adam and Eve in the garden over a tree compared to the final test regarding the Sabbath. There's a remarkable striking parallel between the two. The next uh, one is a short one, the idle Sabbath. Ellen White constantly calls Sunday the idle Sabbath. Why would she call it the idle Sabbath? Well, in that chapter, I think there's an explanation to that particular question. The seal of the living God that's a chapter that actually deals with all of the reasons in the Bible why we believe that the Sabbath in the end time is the seal of God. It does it from several different perspectives. And then finally, I decided to add the newsletter article that I wrote, uh, which wasn't the last one, but the one before last, Reflections on a Sabbath Debate. Uh, some of you, or maybe most of you, received the newsletter and uh, you probably read that article, but I, I consider it a very important article, and so I included it at the end of the syllabus. So basically, this is uh, the content of the course that we're going to have here during this week. Now, in your handout, you'll notice that there are three main schools of thought concerning the seals. We're on the page of the handout now, the th loose pages that uh, you had at the, at the table when you came in. Basically, there's three schools of thought when it comes to the seals. The first school of thought is the preterist school. And basically, that uh, uh, idea is that the seven seals are describing events 
that took place in the history of the, the early history of the Roman Empire and the Jewish nation. In other words, all of the seals were fulfilled 17, 1800 years ago, which has very interesting implications because if the seven seals were fulfilled already, all of them, during the period of the Roman Empire and during the period of uh, the, the Jewish nation, then uh, we're dealing simply with history and they really have no present relevance. So it's very serious, the school of thought that you embrace when you study uh, passages in the book of Revelation. Uh, the second view is the futurist view. And basically what futurists believe is when in Revelation 4 verse 1, a voice tells John, come up here, they say that is the rapture of the church. And then they say that after the rapture of the church, then the seven seals will transpire in order. In other words, the seven seals, all of them are future after the rapture of the church. Now if that is true, then the seven seals have no relevance for us today because they are going to be fulfilled after we're gone to heaven. So what the devil has done through the preterist and through the futurist school is try to convince people that these things have no relevance for us. The preterists say, all fulfilled in the past, it's history. Okay, it might be academically interest, interesting to study it, to know, you know what transpired in history, but it has no present relevance. And for those who believe that the seals are future after the rapture, rapture of the church, then the seals have no relevance for us because supposedly we're going to be gone when the seven seals occur. Are you understanding the point? So if that's the case, why even bother to have this class? But the seals, according to the third school, the historicist school, have very much relevance today. Let's just notice the little um, writing under the historicist school. The historicist school teaches that the introductory vision, that is Revelation 4 and 5, described the arrival of Jesus to His Father at the Ascension. This is very important, the chronology. In other words, the vision of Revelation 4 and 5, in Revelation chapter 4, the Father is sitting on His throne, there are the 24 elders, the four living creatures, the seven lamps of fire which represent the Holy Spirit, and uh, Jesus isn't there yet, the angels, the angelic hosts aren't there. And then in chapter 5, Jesus arrives, He is a lamb as though it had been slain, and He presents His wounds to His Father, His Father accepts His sacrifice, and He begins his intercessory ministry. Uh, so for the historicist school, the seals begin with the ascension of Christ, that's the introductory vision. And then the seven seals are the events that transpire from the point that Jesus begins His intercessory ministry until the second coming of Christ. In other words, the seals describe the events that take place between Christ's inauguration and the consummation when Jesus comes. So you can follow in the seals the sequence of historical events. It's kind of like the seven churches, kind of like the seven trumpets, uh, kind of like uh, Daniel 2 that begins in the days when Daniel wrote and uh, concludes at the second coming of Christ. So basically uh, the seals have much relevance because we can follow the historical trajectory and uh, you know I believe that now we are living in the second part of the sixth seal and uh, soon the events uh, of the sixth seal are going to come to a conclusion. Jesus is going to come and then the seventh seal is going to take place. So we can follow the flow of history and we can know that everything has been fulfilled the way God has said that it's going to be fulfilled and we know exactly where we are and what still needs to be fulfilled. Are you following me or not? Amen. That's the beauty of the historicist method of interpreting uh, Bible prophecy. Now let's notice at the bottom of the page of the handout the historicist principles that we are going to apply. First of all, we allow the Bible to interpret the symbols of the seals because the Bible does not explain the seven seals. <laughs> There's no explanation to the, to the symbols of the seven seals. 
in Revelation chapter 4 through chapter 8 verse 1. You know, you won't find where, where in Revelation chapter 7 you have the seal. It doesn't say the seal is the Sabbath. It doesn't tell you what the trees are. It doesn't tell you what, what, what the sea is. It doesn't explain the symbols. So how do you understand the symbols of the seals? You apply the historicist principle that the Bible is its own interpreter. You go to other texts in the Bible that use the same symbol to understand what the symbol means. So if you find, for example, in uh, Revelation chapter 7 it says that the, uh, that the wind doesn't blow on any tree, you know, you're not looking for a place where there's lots of trees. No, trees symbolize God's people. There are multiple verses that, that compare, he will be like a tree planted next to waters, it says in Psalm 1. So you know that trees there represents God's people. Uh, sea, well you know what sea represents, it represents multitudes, nations, tongues and peoples. But you have to go to other places in scripture that give you the meaning of the symbol. The Bible is its own interpreter. And that's the principle that we're going to apply to the seals. We're going to allow other texts of the Bible to explain the meaning of each symbol. Another point is that we need to carefully consider the order of events or the literary structure, realizing that the literary structure of Revelation is tricky. Maybe I shouldn't have used that word. But, uh, you know, if you think that you're going to, uh, you're going to uh, read Revelation 1 verse 1 through Revelation chapter 22, uh, the last verse, and say, I'm going to find an exact chronology of all of the events that are going to take place from, the, from Revelation 1 through the end of time, you're going to be so confused you don't know what planet you're on. Because the book of Revelation is like Daniel. It, it works in cycles. It goes to flashbacks, it goes forwards, it goes backwards, it repeats, it has cycles. And the key is to be able to determine where a cycle ends and where a new cycle begins. And so we're going to see that in the seals. Uh, and that's a very, very important point. So the historicist principle means that we are going to take a look at the literary structure of the seals as well. Uh, let's go to the next page. It is vitally important to realize that the introductory verses contain the beginning and ending point of the entire series. I'm going to dedicate a few minutes to this because this is crucially important. When the series begins, you have an introductory verse, or sometimes two or three verses, that give you the beginning and ending point of the entire series. Let me give you an example. Go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. We'll pick up on this a little bit later, but um, let's just do it now briefly. Revelation 3, verse 21. This is the conclusion to the seven churches, and it's also the introduction to the seven seals. It gives you two points of time with several events in between. Notice it says, here Jesus is speaking, to him who overcomes, I will, sit to, uh, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Now, uh, there are two points of time here. Jesus overcame and he what? And he sat with his father on his throne. Then he says, if you overcome, you will also sit with the Father, where? With Jesus on His throne. So you have Jesus overcoming, sitting on the throne. If we overcome, we will sit on the throne. So what we're going to notice is that seven seals are simply describing the period between when Jesus sat with His Father on His throne and when we will sit with Jesus on His throne. In other words, the seven seals describe the overcoming of God's people throughout the course of Christian history, culminating with sitting with Jesus on His throne. Are you with me or not? So this one verse gives you the starting point for the seals. That's when Jesus sat with His Father on His throne. It gives you the ending point when after the seals, God's people are victorious and they sit with Jesus on the throne. So... Uh, Introductory verses are extremely important. Let's notice another introductory uh, passage. Revelation chapter 8, 
Revelation chapter 8, this is the introduction to the trumpets. Uh, uh, the introduction to the trumpets. Revelation chapter 8 and uh, verses 2 through 5. Now, our study next year, Lord willing, if uh, we're still here and, you know, final events have not uh, reached us, uh, we will uh, have our class on the trumpets. Uh, that is a very controversial uh, part of Revelation. There are multiple interpretations in the Adventist church. Uh, I don't know the reason why, because I, I've studied them and they seem to be pretty, pretty clear. But we're going to study the trumpets. And there are people in the Adventist church who say that the, all of the trumpets are future. Others see the trumpets as having a dual application. In other words, they were fulfilled and they're going to be fulfilled again in the future. And the reason why many say that the, that the trumpets come uh, after uh, our future is because of what we're going to notice now. Revelation 8, and let's begin at verse uh, 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Uh, let me ask you, up to this point, is the door of probation open? How do we know that? Well, because the prayers of the saints are ascending and Jesus is receiving the prayers of the saints and he's mingling the prayers with the incense of his merits. So we know that up to, up to the point of verse 4, uh, Jesus is interceding. That is the beginning point. When did Jesus begin his intercessions? When he ascended to heaven, at the beginning of the Christian dispensation. But then the scene changes. It says in verse 5, Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So what does the throwing down of the censer represent? If the censer means presenting the prayers of the saints before the Father, what would the throwing down of the censer represent? it will represent that the fact that intercession has ceased. So, and what happens in between when Jesus begins His intercessions and when intercession ends? The seven trumpets are in between. Are you with me or not? So this introductory vision gives you the starting point and it gives you the ending point of the trumpets. Now the same thing, and this becomes a little bit more complex, but let's uh, take the time to do it. Let's go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. This is the conclusion of the seven trumpets. The conclusion of the seven trumpets. And this is where you're going to see that we really need to be careful about studying the, the sequence or the order of events. It says there in Revelation chapter 11, and let's begin at verse 15. Revelation 11 and verse 15, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Now notice what the hymn, uh, the theme of the hymn is, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come. Now notice this, because you have taken your great power and reigned. So what is the seventh trumpet? The seventh trumpet is when Jesus takes over what? Takes over the kingdom. He begins to reign. When does Jesus begin to reign? <clears throat> well, He actually begins to reign when probation closes because His kingdom is complete. The investigative judgment has revealed who are subjects of His kingdom. His kingdom are His subjects. So when the investigative judgment ends, His kingdom is made up. However, Jesus does not take over the reins of the kingdom 
until His second coming. But legally the verdict is already there when probation closes because His kingdom, the group of His followers has been made up by the investigative judgment. Then they go through a time of trouble where it appears that Satan is in control because Ellen White says that, uh, you know, the, after the close of probation, Satan will have full control over the finally impenitent. So it would appear that Satan is in control, even though Jesus has legally taken over the kingdom, now Satan is struggling to keep his kingdom. But then after the tribulation, Jesus empirically and personally takes the kingdom. Are you with me or not? So the seventh trumpet deals with the close of probation and with Jesus taking over his kingdom. So in verse uh, 17, the seventh trumpet ends. But now, in, here's the tricky part. In verse 18, if you read verse 18 after verse 17, you, you're going to be all messed up. Because verse, what verse 18 does is it gives you the structure of the rest of the book. In other words, Revelation 11:18 is giving you the introduction to the main sections of the last half of the book of Revelation. You say, how is that? Well, let's notice uh, those events, uh, and you'll, you'll see this at um, just below the middle of the page where you have those bullet points. Um, it says there in Revelation 11 verse 18, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Now you have several events mentioned in this verse. You have first of all, the nations were what? The nations were angry. Now when it says the nations were angry, who are they angry at? See this doesn't mean that they're just mad at each other. It means that they're angry at whom? They're angry at God and they're angry at God's people. The nations were angry. And then it says, your wrath has come. Let me ask you, what is God's wrath? Where is God's wrath poured out? In the seven last plagues. Is that before or after the close of probation? That's after the close of probation. And then it says, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. Now you say, now wait a minute. Doesn't the judgment take place before the seven last plagues are poured out? Yes. yes. But maybe this judgment is not talking about the pre-advent investigated judgment. Maybe this is talking about the millennial judgment. And you're going to see that that's just the case. So it says, um, once again, the nations were angry. That's happening now during probationary time. Angry at God's people. Your wrath has come, that's God's response to the anger of the nations, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and notice, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So you have uh, this section here, you have five events. The nations were angry, which is happening now, and it's going to intensify, to the point where you have a Sunday law, a death decree. Your wrath has come, that's God's response to the anger of the nations against His people. The time to judge the dead, the time to reward God's servants, and the time to destroy those who destroy the earth. Now you'll notice on the left hand side the sections in the last half of Revelation that are being dealt with. Revelation chapter 12 through 14 describes the anger of the nations. In other words, that's an amplification of that phrase, the nations were angry. Is that the emphasis of Revelation chapter 12? Yes. The dragon wants to kill the man-child. The dragon persecutes the woman for 1260 years. Then the dragon was angry at the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God. The central theme is the anger of the nations against Christ and His people. Revelation 13, you have the beast that receives, uh, receives power and throne and authority from the dragon. The dragon is the Roman Empire, the same empire that wanted to kill Jesus. 
And then the beast that receives the power and the throne persecutes God's people for 1260 years. And then a beast rises from the earth that gives a decree that you can't buy or sell. And whoever doesn't receive the mark of the beast is going to be killed. Is that the anger of the nations? Oh yeah, absolutely. And then after the three, when the three angels' messages are proclaimed, then you have the wicked gathered around Jerusalem. They're in the wine press. They want to destroy those who are within the city because they've accepted the messages of the three angels. So the central theme of Revelation 12, 13, and 14 is the anger of the nations against God's people. And it's summarized in that one phrase that introduces the second half of the book. Are you following me? Then your wrath has come. Where would that be described? Well, that would be the next section in the last half of Revelation. You read Revelation 15, it speaks about the close of probation. It says there that uh, the temple is filled with smoke, the heavenly temple, which refers to the most holy place. No one can enter the temple until the seven last plagues have been poured out. So that's a close of probation, and the seven last plagues are God's wrath. Are you following me or not? So Revelation 15 through 19 describes the close of probation and the seven last plagues. All of that section deals with the seven last plagues. Now you say, what about the time to judge the dead? Well, if we're following in chronological order, which dead is this talking about judging? It's not talking about the investigative judgment of God's people before the second coming, because, <laughs> because the plagues, once the plagues are poured out, probation has closed. Are you with me or not? So it must refer to another investigative, another, other dead people who are being judged. Who will those be? Those wicked people who remained on earth and are being judged during the millennium. Is there a millennial judgment? Revelation chapter 20 says that judgment was committed to those who, who were beheaded because they did not worship the beast, his image, or receive the mark. So the time to judge the dead is not the righteous dead, it's the time to, to judge the wicked dead who have been left here at the second coming. Are you with me? And then, is that the same time that God rewards His people? When He begins the, to judge the wicked, does He also reward His people? Yes, He does. The same time at the second coming. You know, Jesus takes His people to heaven. He rewards them with, he with heaven, and the judgment of the wicked begins. And then, what is the last section of the book of Revelation? Well, you'll notice in Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15, the wicked are destroyed. In other words, those who destroyed the earth are they themselves destroyed after they are judged. So, Revelation 11, 18 is actually a summary of the second half of the book of Revelation, the main events. Now you say, are you on target? Well, let's read this statement from Ellen White. She knew this all the time. <laughs> you know, she, I don't think Ellen White, uh, you know, sat down to study the literary structure <laughs> of the trumpets. But she did, received divine revelation. She always presented everything exactly the way it is. With, with no PhD. With no, no super... Uh, you, you know, studying what all the scholars said. No, no, Ellen White gets everything right because she was inspired by God. She put everything in the right order. Notice this statement from Early Writings, page 36. Then I saw that Jesus would not leave the most holy place until every case was decided either for salvation or destruction, and that the wrath of God could not come until Jesus had finished His work in the most holy place, laid off his, his priestly attire, and clothed Himself with the garments of vengeance. So, when is it that the wrath of God is going to come? Before the close of probation or after the close of probation? After Jesus ceases His intercessions. Then Jesus will step, step out from between the Father and man. God will keep silence no longer, but pour out His wrath on those who have rejected His truth. Now listen to this. I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct. 
one following the order, the, the other. So are the events in Revelation 11, 18 in chronological order? Yes or no? According to Ellen White, are they in chronological order? Yes. Absolutely, they're in chronological order. Now, the question is, um, when, it says, when Ellen White says here, I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct, so is the time to judge the dead after the close of probation, according to this statement? Yes, yes. because she says there's an order. The nations angry, first of all, then the wrath of God, which is the seven last plagues, then the time to judge the dead. So can this be the investigative judgment of the righteous? It cannot be the investigative judgment of the righteous. It's that simple. So we know from the testimony of Ellen White that the anger of the nations represents the anger of the wicked against God's people. God's wrath being poured out is the seven last plagues. And uh, the judgment of the dead is not the judgment of the righteous dead. It is the judgment of what? The judgment of the wicked dead. And then she ends the statement by saying, uh, once again, let's begin. I saw the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct, one following the other. Also that Michael had not stood up, and that the time of trouble such as never was had not yet commenced. Now notice the chronological detail. The nations are now getting angry. So was that part still during probationary time? The anger of the nations still during probationary time? Yes. Uh, is the wrath of God after probationary time? Is the judgment of the dead after God pours out the seven last plagues? Fantastic. Ellen White had it right. And so we end the statement, the nations are now getting angry, but when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary, he will stand up, put on the garments of vengeance, and then the seven last plagues will be poured out. And then I want you to notice how important this issue of where new series begin and when, where series end. Unless, listen, we can interpret symbols till we're blue in the face. But if we don't know how revelation is organized, how the events, what the sequence of the events is, when one series ends and the next series begins, when there's a flashback, when it takes you forward, we're, we're not going to even know where we're at. So even, uh, maybe I shouldn't say even more important, but just as important as being able to interpret individual symbols, what, mean, what they mean, and put them together, it's crucially important to know how the book of Revelation was organized, the sequence of events, how the book is organized. And uh, so let's go now to Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. See, if you, if you want to read this in chronological order, it won't make any sense. Revelation eleven nineteen. 19, after we find the summary of the rest of the book, it says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of His covenant was seen in His temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Do you see what the problem is here? If you take Revelation 11, 19 as taking place after Re Revelation 11, verse 18, you're going to be in serious trouble. <laughs> Revelation 11, 19 is the introductory verse to the rest of the book. Re verse 18 gives you all of the, the summary of all of the events Revelation 11, 19 gives you the starting point for the last half, and that is the beginning of the investigative judgment in 1844. Every single time that Ellen White quotes Revelation 11, 19, she applies it to what happened in 1844. So can you read Revelation 11, 19 in chronological sequence with the verse that comes before? No, you'll be all goofed up. But when you realize that Revelation 11:19 is the introduction to the last half uh, to, to the last half of the book, that the focus is going to be the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, 
then it makes sense. And incidentally, this verse not only gives us the starting point, the temple of God opened in heaven, the ark of His covenant seen in His temple, but it also gives us the ending point. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. That's exactly what happens at the seventh plague. <laughs> Are you with me? So, so once again you have the introduction. Uh, the, the, the point is the, that Revelation chapter 12 and following is going to focus primarily on what happens after 1844, the investigative judgment in heaven. And when that concludes at the seventh plague, which uh, we're not going to read now, that's where you have lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. So um, how important then is it to understand that Revelation is not written in chronological order? You know, there's a reason why the Christian world is so goofed up. Because they're using the wrong method. They're trying to open the door with the wrong key. Only historicism will help people unlock the secrets of the book of Revelation. There's no other method that will do it. Futurism is broke. Preterism is broke. Only historicism makes the book of Revelation relevant and understandable. Now, the last point that I want to deal with in this introductory aspect is that sometimes we are very inconsistent in our way of interpreting prophecies of the book of Revelation. And for a moment, I'm going to uh, mention something about the seven trumpets. Uh, we are going to study, as I mentioned before, next year, Lord willing, at Anchor, uh, the seven trumpets, which cover Revelation, basically Revelation chapter 8 through Revelation chapter, the end of chapter 11 of the book of Revelation. And, um, you know, there are many different views of the trumpets. Some say that the trumpets are totally future. Some say that the trumpets are in the past. Some say that there's a dual application to the trumpets, you know, uh, they were fulfilled in the past and they're going to be fulfilled in the future. But uh, the reason why people have all of these different views is because they're very inconsistent in the methods that they use. Let's just go through some of those things. We're at the bottom of page 2. The inconsistency of method. Now, the prophetic series all begin with what? When you have a prophetic sequence, they always, be, always begin in the day in which the prophet wrote. Correct? Where does Daniel 2 begin? Babylon. Did Daniel live in Babylon? Yes. Okay. Daniel 7? Is it beginning with Babylon? Yes, Daniel 8 begins with Medo-Persia. Did Daniel live during the period of Medo-Persia? Yes. Daniel 11 begins with what? Medo-Persia. Was Daniel alive? Yes. So where does the prophetic chain begin? It begins in the time when the prophet wrote. How about Revelation chapter 12? The dragon that tries to kill the man-child. Is that in the time of John? Yes, absolutely. Revelation 13, the dragon gives his throne, his power, and authority to the beast. The dragon is the Roman Empire. So you're starting at the Roman Empire again. And then you have, uh, uh, you know, you have the seven churches. Where do the seven churches begin? They begin in the apostolic times. Where do the seals begin? The white horse, apostolic times. So here's the problem. Why does Uriah Smith begin the trumpets in the 4th century with the barbarian invasions? Are you, see, are you seeing the inconsistency? All of the prophetic chains begin in the days when the prophet lived. But they say the trumpets, that's the exception. You know, the trumpets begin not in the 1st century, they begin in the 4th century with the barbarian invasions we begin to detect a problem. Furthermore, is there any evidence that chain prophecies have a dual application? Do the seven churches have a dual application? 
to the past and the future? No. Does Daniel 7 have a dual application? Can you say that Daniel 7 is fulfilled twice, once in the past it's go and, and then it's fulfilled in the future again? How about Revelation 13? Does that have a dual fulfillment? No. So why, do we, why would we say that the seven trumpets have a dual fulfillment? If none of the other chain prophecies have a dual fulfillment. Daniel chapter 2 has one fulfillment. And you use the historicist method. It helps you know exactly where you are at any given moment in the study of the prophecy. So you can follow the trajectory. It begins with the head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, the stone that hits the image, the mountain, the everlasting kingdom. You've been enabled to follow the flow of the prophecy from beginning to end. So does Daniel 2 have two fulfillments? No, it's got one. Does Daniel 7 have two fulfillments? The lion represents Babylon, but then something else in the future. No. The bear can represent something in the past, something in the future. No. Chain prophecies, you have the lion, Babylon, the bear, Medo-Persia, the leopard, Greece, the dragon beast, Rome, the ten horns, the divisions of Rome, the little horn, the papacy, and so on. So why would you say that the trumpets have a dual fulfillment? If in chain prophecies you have basically one historicist fulfillment. Furthermore, uh, in the interpretation that is given of the trumpets, why would John dedicate four trumpets to the barbarian invasions? I mean, the <laughs> barbarian invasions were important, but four trumpets to the barbarian invasions? And by the way, specific names are given to individuals that fulfill the trumpets. Mohammed, Odoacer, Attila the Hun, you know, they, nowhere in any of the other uh, chain prophecies do you have individual names fulfilled. They are movements. They are kingdoms that fulfill Bible prophecy. Furthermore, in the trumpets, you find the, the inconsistency of applying the symbols in the trumpets. You know, different, a different method is applied to interpreting the symbols of the trumpets than what is used to interpret the symbols in other passages of Bible prophecy. You know, you read, for example, uh, some books on the uh, seven trumpets, some Adventist books on the seven trumpets, and what they'll do is sometimes they'll interpret the symbols literally and sometimes they'll interpret them as symbolic. There appears to be really no method, uh, no hermeneutical method to interpret the symbols. As Adventists we've understood that the symbols before the second coming, the symbols represent something uh, that is not literal but is symbolic. But uh, in many of the expositions of the trumpets you have a literalizing uh, of symbols which really should be understood uh, in a symbolic sense. Uh, one final point that we have on this is that um, in the series on the trumpets many see uh, the, the Muslims fulfilling uh, as for particularly the fifth and sixth trumpets. Now uh, the big question is, where do you find the Muslims in any of the prophetic chains? Are the Muslims in Daniel 2? No. Are the Muslims in Daniel 7? No. Are the Muslims in Daniel 8 and 9? No. Are the Muslims in Daniel 11? No. Are the Muslims in the seven churches? Are the Muslims in the seven seals? Are the Muslims in Revelation 12? Are they in Revelation 13? They appear nowhere in any of the prophetic chains. So why would there be a, a great emphasis in the trumpet series on the role of the Muslims? These are questions that we need to ask ourselves when we study the trumpets. And uh, we're going to look at it in detail uh, in our next anchor class.
So basically, these are some of the things that we have to take into account when we uh, study not only the seals, but other passages of Scripture as well. So let me ask you, uh, was what we looked at so far clear? Were you able to follow and understand uh, what we've dealt with? So we are going to apply these principles to uh, the study of the seals. All of these historicist principles that we find come from Scripture itself. Now what we want to do is we want to go to page 3. And um, we are going to begin our study of the seals particularly the introductory vision. But before we go to the introductory vision, we need to take a look at events that happened while Christ was still on earth. Because the introductory vision simply points to His ascension to heaven and His inauguration as the interceding high priest. We need to look at some events that transpired uh, while Jesus was on this earth. So first of all, what we want to notice is that Jesus is the Creator, and because He is the Creator, He is responsible for our existence. Is that a true statement? He's not responsible for our sin. He's responsible for our existence because He created us. Notice John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, that is Jesus, the Word, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So who was the creator of all things? Jesus. So did Jesus create all of us? No, you came from your mother, folks. And where did your mother come from? From her mother. And where did her mother come from? Well, from her mother. So if you go back all the way to the beginning, where do you end the chain? With Adam and Eve. So when Jesus created Adam and Eve, He created all of us because we all come from them. So He's responsible for the existence of every person here on planet earth. Now at the beginning, when Jesus created this world, He placed Adam as the original ruler over this realm. Adam was the king, in other words, of this realm, of this world. Psalm 8 verses 3 through 5 tells us this. One evening uh, the psalmist was contemplating the heavens and he wrote these words, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? You have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him. This is speaking about the creation of Adam. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Who wears crowns? Kings. Now every king has a realm of dominion. So Adam was created to be king. King of what? Notice verse 6, you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. That means that he's the ruler. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. So God chose Adam as the king and his territory was everything relating to planet earth. However, there was a condition for him to remain ruler over this realm, and that was to offer God sinless perfection. And Adam did not offer what God required. And therefore, the Bible tells us that Satan usurped the throne that belonged to Adam and the territory over which he ruled. And we find this in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. This is on the Mount of Temptation. It says, Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, 
showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, by this time there were many kingdoms, it was still the planet earth, and the devil said to him, all this authority, that's the position, right? All the authority I will give you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, who delivered it to him? Adam. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me, all will be yours. So who took over the throne of this world? Satan. And this became his realm of dominion, his territory. Of course, he usurped it. It was not rightfully his. He stole it from Adam. In Romans 6 verse 16, which is not in your syllabus, it says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are slaves of whom you obey? And Adam chose to obey Satan, and therefore he became a slave of Satan. And, of course, all of his descendants sinned, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, so all of Adam's descendants became slaves as well. Now, man or mankind therefore needed some way to be saved. See, Jesus now says, I'm responsible for their existence. They've sinned. They're lost. They're going to die. They're going to suffer second death. I need to implement a plan so that they can recover what was lost. Now we're going to notice in our next study together that the Redeemer of the lost possession and the Emancipator from slavery had to be a next of kin. In other words, had to be a close relative in order to redeem someone who had sold himself into slavery or someone who had sold their patrimony or their, the, the, the land over which they, they governed only a next of kin could recover by making a payment what had been lost. But we're going to find that the problem is that within the human race there was no one who had not sold himself into slavery. And there was no one who had not relinquished their possession. Because the Bible says that all are sinners and come short of the glory of God. So within the human race, there was no one who could recover the last lost possession. But we shall see that someone did show up.